where the heck did they go? I literally just sat them right here. Oh, <laughs> hey creeps. How's it going? Uh, for those who are new here, hi. My name is Cameron Chaney, author of Autumn Crow, and welcome to Library Macabre. I just realized it is time for another wrap-up video, so I'm going to be showing you all of the books that I read in the month of May. It is May, right? Yeah, last month was May. Okay, we're good. <laughs> we're, we're on track. So in the month of May, I read a total of... God, I'm gonna have to check. I am totally unprepared for this video. 14. I read 14 books in the month of May. So that's not too bad, right? I feel like that's pretty good for one month. So I read a couple of graphic novels, uh, some horror anthologies. I read some vintage teen horror, and I even read what I am assuming is a new favorite book of mine. So I'm really excited to talk about that. The only issue is I have been trying to find the books that I read last month. And, you know, the problem of having an entire room full of books, thousands of books, is that you sometimes misplace books. And the fact that the shelves like to just move around the library by themselves, it just confuses me, you know? It makes it really hard to keep track of what I have. But that's okay, because we are gonna find these books together, and I'm gonna talk to you about them and review them for you, so that way you can have some new books to read, because that's what you need, right? You don't have too many books as it is. I think first off, we're gonna start with the adult horror anthologies that I read. So I'm gonna head on over to my adult horror section and see if I can find these. So let's go. All right, I found the short story collections and anthologies. So the first one I have here is called Twisted Tainted Tales. This is the debut book from Janine Pipe. This, of course, is a short story collection with a retro twist. So in this book, we have your average horror tropes with a different kind of twist to them. So of course you have stories about werewolves and vampires and serial killers and ghosts and pretty much everything you can imagine. And the majority of the stories take place in the 80s or the 90s. So of course it's harking back to simpler times in horror when you did have these tropes and it was okay. It was before those tropes really had a whole lot of a chance to be overused. But what I like about this book is that Janine treats these tropes with a lot of love and a lot of care. It's clear that she is a hardcore horror fan, that she really knows her stuff. And this is all coming from a place that is very near and dear to her heart. You can see it in every word. So on one hand, while these stories are very nostalgic, the stories also have a very interesting modern twist to them. I just feel that Janine handled these stories beautifully. And I don't want to say a whole lot more about this because I actually did a full reading vlog where I vlogged about my experience while reading the stories in this book. I go into a whole lot more detail in that video, so if you want to see it, I'll post that up there in the card symbol somewhere. But definitely check this out. I thought it was a lot of fun. I would recommend this if you are a horror fan. I think people who maybe aren't as experienced with the genre won't really get it so much. But if you are a hardcore horror fan, there is a lot in here that you are going to enjoy. I found myself picking up on all of the Easter eggs, and it was just a lot of fun. Very fun for the horror lover inside of me. Next up is a little book called Devil's Night by Curtis M. Lawson. This was recently released as a limited hardcover edition from Weird House Press. And I have to say, first and foremost, that this is a beautiful, beautiful book. As you can see, the cover art itself is gorgeous. And not only that, but the rest of the book is illustrated as well. These are illustrations by Luke Spooner, and damn, he did a great job. These illustrations are just magnificent. They are stunning, they are creepy, they are epic. And while they give me feelings of unease and like the end of the world is looking back at me, they still have a kind of beauty to them. The book also has this really nice ribbon bookmarker as well as marbled in papers. I think you can still get this on Weird House's website for about $40, which is a steal because this is a signed limited edition. The book is signed by Curtis M. Lawson as well as Luke Spooner, the illustrator, and it is limited to 150 signed and numbered copies. As you can see, I have number 149. It's just a really beautiful book and I think it's totally worth the $40. And not only for the physical book, but for the stories inside, because this here 
is one of my new favorite books. So if you are not familiar with Devil's Night, clearly you have not seen The Crow from 1994. If you haven't, go watch it. It's a great movie. Devil's Night is an actual thing. This actually happens in Detroit, Michigan on October 30th every year. At least it used to. It's not as bad as it used to be. And basically Devil's Night was where the people of Detroit would take to the streets and vandalize and destroy, set fires. It was rough dark times for Detroit. Fortunately, things are not quite as bad as they used to be on Devil's Night. I guess the city has really buckled down on the crime and the amount of fires that were started. But this book goes all the way back to October 30th, 1987, and each story follows a different character or cast of characters as they try to survive Devil's Night in Detroit, Michigan. Most of the stories have themes of repression and guilt and grief of people trying desperately to make a new life for themselves or to get out of the city and feeling like they're completely trapped. And likewise, we also have some stories from characters who are quite enjoying their time wreaking havoc and destroying lives in their city. So the stories really walk this fine line between pure darkness and hope. God, there's one story in here. Let me see what it's called. I can't remember what it's called. Through Hell for One Kiss. This story wrecked me. So basically we are following this woman who seems to have returned home and she's noting how different everything used to be in this house. And she's kind of just going from room to room, remembering the times she had with her boyfriend who she used to live with. And it becomes clear pretty early on that she may not be alive. And God, <laughs> I finished the story with tears running down my face. It was so beautiful and dark and messed up and sweet all at the same time. And it is by far my new favorite short story that I have ever read. I highly recommend this. This was beautiful. I gave it five stars. The perfect read in every way. It was so well written. The stories are tight. They never stray, but they're they're just detailed enough, you know? So there is my glowing review of Devil's Night by Curtis M. Lawson. If you want to see more in-depth thoughts on this book, you can go to my Goodreads page where I do like a full written review. Just buy it. Go to their website and buy it. I'll leave links down below. And I read one more anthology, and that is All Dark Places, a Dragon Soul Press anthology edited by J.E. Feldman. So so this book is actually from the same publisher who did Spectre of Springwell Forest by Simon Dillon. That's a book that I reviewed last month and I had some very mixed feelings on it as you probably saw if you watched my video. This also has a story from Simon Dillon so I was a little bit on the fence. I wasn't sure really what to expect from this book and I will go ahead and say this is a decent read. It's nothing that blew my socks off, but I would say if you don't like a whole bunch of blood and guts in your horror stories, you want something that's a little bit more atmospheric, I think you would really enjoy this. I would definitely recommend this to people who are kind of just starting out with the horror genre and they don't want something that's too scary. So this is a collection of five short ish stories. The stories range from about 30 to 50 pages. All Dark Places is bookended by two stories by Hugh Lang. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. So the first one is called Dark Secrets in Hidden Pass and the last one is called The Mark of the Spider. So Dark Secrets and Hidden Pass is actually more of like a, a dark horror fantasy. It's more of a high fantasy. That threw me off because I don't really read a whole lot of fantasy these days. I like fantasy. I just have to be in the mood for it. I haven't really read any fantasy, especially high fantasy, in years. Like, it's been probably five years since I've read anything like that. Since that's the story that introduces the book, it really threw me off, and I actually had to skip it and come back to it last because I just wasn't in the mood for it. But the last story by Hugh Lane is The Mark of the Spider, and I really like that. This is a noir pulp horror story. That one was really cool, very well written, and the first story by Hugh Lane is also very well written. I just wasn't really in the mood for it, you know? The second story in the book is called The Cursed Mirror by Anna Sinjin, and I'm sorry yet again if I mispronounced your name. So backing up a bit, when the movie Oculus, directed by Mike Flanagan, came out, I expected it to be kind of like one of those movies that you go and see, and it's fun, it's cheesy, there's a bunch of jump scares, you walk out of the theater, you had a good time, you don't regret seeing it, but at the same time, you're not really gonna remember it later on. That movie ended up actually really surprising me and was very effective and 
was my introduction to Mike Flanagan. And I now know that I will never underestimate that man because he is a genius. Basically the cursed mirror is kind of what I thought Oculus was going to be. It has some of those horror movie jump scares written in and I, I knew where it was going. It's not a bad story. It's just not something that really knocked my socks off. And I'm glad that it wasn't a full novel because I probably would have gotten very tired of it. But since it was only like 30 pages, I don't mind so much. It was just a quick, fun little read. Then we have Once in a Lifetime by Simon Dillon. Didn't know what to expect. All I know is that Simon Dillon is a good writer. I just didn't really like some of the plot elements of his novel, Spectre of Springwell Forest. However, <laughs> Once in a Lifetime was fantastic. So we have this man who at the beginning of the story wakes up in this apartment building with this woman that is not his wife. He does not know who she is. He doesn't know how he got here. All he knows is that he is suddenly married to this woman and has this long life with her that he can't remember. And at the same time, he is wondering what happened to his wife? What happened to his kids? Where is he? Is he in some kind of alternate dimension? This story took a very dark turn and it also kind of sort of made me tear up a little bit at the end, even though it's super dark and black and bleak, it definitely drew an emotional reaction out of me. Just because I was iffy on his novel doesn't mean I'm not interested in what he's doing because I think he has a lot of talent and I'm curious to see where he goes with that in the future. Then we have The Harrison Farm by A.M. Cummins and this was another kind of haunted house story. This is a story that I would describe as being very accessible. So if you're somebody who's kind of a newbie to horror, you don't really know where to start, this is pretty much your basic run-of-the-mill haunted house story. For somebody just starting out, I think they would have a lot of fun with it. It's not too scary, it's not too graphic. This is very much a starter pack kind of book. So if you're kind of worried about dipping your toes into horror, you don't really know where to start, I'd say this is a pretty good option. All right, so those are the horror anthologies that I read in the month of May. And since my Goosebumps collection is right behind me, I'm going to pick out a book because I actually read one this month. And the one that I read was Scream School. This is one of the books in the series 2000 series. Now this is a series that I've not really read as much of as the original series. Of course, I've read pretty much all of the original series, but the series 2000 books, I've read a couple. They didn't really do it for me so much, so this is kind of a gray area for me. But I decided, you know what, I really like this cover art by Tim Jacobus. I love this spiky-haired punk guy with a melting face. It's pretty creepy. So I was like, you know what, kind of in a Goosebumps mood, kind of want to read a Goosebumps book. So I picked this up randomly. Did I like it? No. <laughs> Just gonna jump right to the chase. No, I did not. I gave this one star. The plot of this book is pretty much my problem with the Goosebumps series 2000 series. There are a couple of series 2000 books that I really like, but for the most part, I feel like the plots just really meander and they don't really go anywhere. It's just like a bunch of random stuff being thrown at you. So in this book, we have our main character whose dad is a horror movie director. And basically this kid's dad believes that his son is scared of everything. Even though he's really not, his dad will just keep jumping out, scaring him, startling him. And he's like, ha, huh, you're a chicken. And he's like, no, I'm not. You just keep jumping out at me. Would you stop it? So basically they're about to go to this actual haunted school to film a movie. And the dad decides to bring his son along with him. And the son decides that he's gonna use this opportunity to prove to his dad that he is not a chicken. And that's it. That's the plot of the book. Some creepy things will happen and then you realize, oh, it's just a scene in a movie or it's all a dream sequence. And basically it's just really just a story of the kid trying to prove to his dad that he's brave. As soon as it would get interesting, Stein would just pull it back and you'd be left with this and I didn't like it. So <laughs> yeah, uh, there's that. Uh, I thought I'd have a lot more fun uh, going back and reading a Goosebumps book that I hadn't read before, but I just didn't like it. However, I did read a few more R.L. Stein books in the month of May, and we're gonna go take a look at those right now. All right, so first off, I have the first two books in the Fear Street series by R.L. Stein. I already did a Fear Street reading vlog. In fact, I am still doing a Fear Street reading vlog all the way through the months of June and July, going with the movies. So 
I'm gonna link my reading vlog for these two books up there in the card symbol so you can go and give it a watch. I've already talked about these books in length and this video is gonna be long enough as it is. So I'm gonna leave it there, but I really enjoyed these. They're Fear Street. I mean, they're like my favorite books of all time. Now, a book that I have not talked about yet is The Boyfriend by R.L. Stein. This is one of the books in the Point Horror series. And basically the reason why I decided to read this book was because a viewer was like, hey, have you read The Boyfriend by R.L. Stein? That book almost made me throw up. And immediately, like, the minute after I read that comment, I picked up this book and was like, okay, I need to read this finally because I've had this sitting on my shelf for years and I've never picked it up. And I just wanna read you the synopsis for this one because it says everything. Like, I don't need to say anything else about this book. The synopsis says it all. Too bad about Dex. He was in love with Joanna. She broke up with him and then he died. Joanna's sorry, of course, but it's not her fault he's dead, is it? Besides, she never loved him. Boys are just toys to be used and thrown away. But this time, Joanna's gone too far because Dex is back from the dead for one last date with her. The synopsis makes it sound like Joanna is basically being punished because she broke up with her boyfriend. Yeah, I get her decision to dump him, but she's also really mean about it. She goes to their meeting spot. They're supposed to have a meeting together at the mall and he shows up but she is watching from behind a column. She's like hiding from him. The line in the book is she wants to stand him up, but she also wants to watch while she does it. So she's just kind of a mean character and Dex is not a whole lot better. And it basically, it just escalates into pure insanity. This is just pure trashy pulp and I loved it. It was a really great time. The book took all kinds of twists and turns that I wasn't really expecting. And the ending is just completely absurd. I loved it. It's fun, it's, it's trashy. It's exactly what I wanted from a book like this. So those are all of the vintage young adult teen books that I read in the month of May. I also read some Boxcar Children books. Boxcar Children is another one of my favorite vintage series. So let's go on over to my mystery section and we'll talk about the Boxcar Children. All right, so Boxcar Children. This is a series about a group of siblings who were orphaned when they were kids. So they ran off to live in this boxcar in the woods. So the first book is pretty much about them trying to make their own life in this boxcar. It's, it's kind of weird to think about how this, the series morphed from kind of a survival story in a way to these kids solving mysteries in this little town. So basically the kids live in this boxcar in the first book and then they realize that their grandfather that they were kind of afraid to live with isn't all that bad a guy. So he takes the kids into his custody and raises them and they solve mysteries. Like <laughs> that, that's that's the gist of the series. The series is just cozy and fun. And every single time I read a boxcar children book, I'm just transported back to my childhood Back to simpler times, it gives me all of those warm feelings in my stomach. I actually used to have a ton of these books and I don't know what happened to them all. They must've gotten sold at a yard sale or something, but I've been managing to collect a few more books in the series now that I'm an adult. But you know, I was thinking about it and I'm like, you know what, I've, I've never actually read the first Boxcar Children. I don't think I've actually ever read that book. So I went to my trusty Hoopla app and I downloaded the audiobook of the first Boxcar Children book and I listened to it. What I didn't know is that I had downloaded the original 1920s text of the Boxcar Children. The text that is most widely known today is the rewritten text from the 40s. That text is actually a little bit lighter. The origins of the Boxcar Children isn't quite as grim, but on the first page of the original 1920s text, we are reading about the Boxcar Children's parents and basically their dad is an alcoholic. Their parents die on the first page and that's when the kids run away to live in this boxcar. I was like, whoa, <laughs> we are talking about an alcoholic father and the death of their parents is referenced point blank, like from page one. And that's something that's not really ever referenced in the book so much. You, you get the gist that they were orphaned, but you never really hear like, oh, their parents died. And it's also just kind of weird after reading so many of the mystery books, going back and reading the first one, and there's no mystery inside. It's basically a book about kids with a really bad case of adulting. Like these kids are better at being an adult than I am. It was interesting, I will say, though I do enjoy the actual like mystery boxcar children books a whole lot more. I think I gave the first book of the boxcar children like three-ish stars. It's not great, but it was interesting to go back and read the origins for myself.
Another mystery audiobook that I listened to was Lending a Paul. This is the first book in the Bookmobile Cat mystery series. This is a cozy mystery series about a woman, a librarian, who has just started the bookmobile in her town. So she's going around town delivering books to people and she discovers a dead body. Of course, she then has to start playing detective and figure out who killed this man. I work on a bookmobile, so I felt like it was necessary for me to read this series. Everybody is always recommending it to me all the time. So I listened to the audiobook on Hoopla and it was really good. I really enjoyed it. It's a cozy mystery series. It's pretty much exactly what you would expect. It's a small town. There's this young librarian trying to make it in this town, trying to make an impression. Her cat stows away on the bookmobile and becomes kind of the main attraction. So she's worried she's going to get in trouble with the library about that. It's just, it's fun. It's cozy. I don't really have to say much more about it. It's not like anything that's going to blow your socks off. But if you want something that's just light, just, just a breezy read, this is definitely a good option. I also read three graphic novels in the month of May. The first two I read were Tales for a Halloween Night, which is kind of produced by John Carpenter, who directed Halloween, of course. This is kind of like a Tales from the Crypt style anthology comic. I thought I was really going to like this. Instead, I hated it. The stories were bland and boring. They had no flavor at all. They're basically watered down versions of Tales from the Crypt stories. Tales from the Crypt actually had really decent stories that made an impact. That's why those comics are classics. They were able to tell a full story in a very few amount of pages. This, on the other hand, the stories feel like little snippets, like little flash fiction. And not only that, but the artwork just wasn't good. Like it's it's glossy and it just doesn't feel right. I gave it one star. I, I'm not going to continue on with the comic. It just isn't worth it to me. Fortunately, I got it from the library, so I didn't spend anything on it. I personally wouldn't recommend it, but who knows? You might actually like it. So if you really want to give it a go, then go for it. Another one that I got from the library is called Halloween Tales. And I thought I was really going to love this comic as well, because look at the cover. It's beautiful, right? It has all of those Halloween vibes. Unfortunately, the stories in this book, there are only four stories, were very boring and very bland, and the artwork just didn't do it for me. It got to the point where I was just kind of skimming through pages because I was not vibing with any of it. I expected all of these nostalgic Halloween feelings like the movie Trick or Treat. However, there is another Halloween-themed graphic novel that I read, and that is The Last Halloween, Volume 1, Children. This book was awesome. And it's really weird and hard to describe. So basically, it takes place on Halloween. We are following this young girl who has been caught up in what's essentially this Halloween apocalypse. I don't usually like apocalypse stories, but this is different. Essentially, every single one of us human beings has a monster that is attached to us and it hides in the shadows. And basically, it's waiting for its chance to be in the light, but it knows it never will be. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> I kind of wrote a story similar to this, but it's okay. But the person who has been keeping these monsters locked away and at bay for so many years has been put into a coma. So now the monsters are free. They break out of their prisons and they start attacking people on Halloween night. These monsters go crazy and they are just devouring people and ripping them apart. The book is violent and gory. There is some crazy imagery in this book, but it's also really cute and funny at the same time. I would say it's like if Tim Burton directed Over the Garden Wall, but take some 80s horror movie gore effects and just throw them into the mix. It just gets insane. And this kid has to go off with this group of monsters and try to put an end to this reign of terror. I can't wait for volume two. I am pumped. It was awesome. I think I gave this four and a half stars. Just a fantastic read and something I will definitely be reading every Halloween. The only complaint I had was that there really wasn't enough Halloween. Like I wanted more pumpkins and stuff, but still it's a really solid read. I highly recommend it. I have two more books. So I also listened to the audiobook of Summer of Fear by Lois Duncan. This is a young adult horror novel that was written in the 70s. And Lois Duncan is, of course, the author of some of my favorite books, I Know What You Did Last Summer and Killing Mr. Griffin. I love those books, but I had never read Summer of Fear. So I decided to give it a listen. This is the story of a 17-year-old girl whose cousin's parents just died in a terrible car accident. 
So the cousin is coming to live with our main character and her family. Right off the bat, there's a lot of tension between our main character and her cousin because her cousin is now staying in her bedroom. And of course, our heroine does not want to give up her bedroom, but she does it because this girl's just lost her parents and it would be kind of selfish to be like, no, I'm not gonna let you have my room. At first, her cousin is very odd. She has a very strange way of speaking. She's also very reserved, very buttoned up. She doesn't seem to have any idea of how to dress like a teenage girl, but that quickly starts to change when she blossoms into this beautiful girl. Everybody is falling in love with her. Her parents become obsessed with this girl. Even her own brother becomes obsessed with his cousin and it's a little weird. There's also some other weird things going on with this girl and our main character is starting to catch on and she's beginning to suspect that maybe her cousin is actually a witch. I loved this book. Even though the writing can tend to be a little bit dated because it was written in the 70s. It may not have aged well, but it's still a well-written book and I had a lot of fun with it. I will just say that if you like teen horror, definitely check out Summer of Fear by Lois Duncan. There's also a 70s TV movie directed by Wes Craven that is on Amazon Prime, I believe. I would really like to give it a watch. And last but not least, I reread one of my favorite books and that is Paperbacks from Hell by Grady Hendrix. I talk about this book all the time. I had already read it twice, so this is my third time reading it, and I decided to listen to the audiobook this time around because I hadn't before. It's just such a pretty visual book that I didn't think it would work as an audiobook, but it really did. While reading this book the first two times, I was so distracted by all of the covers that I did miss a lot of things about the text itself. So by listening to the audiobook, I caught and picked up on a lot more that I had missed the first two times I had read the book. I'm not gonna say a whole lot more about it because I already have a review on my channel of this book, but it's fantastic. If you like vintage horror or just horror in general, read this. It's a blast. It's such a good book, five stars. Every single time I've read it, five stars. And there you go. Those are all of the books that I read in the month of May. I hope you guys enjoyed this wrap up. Please, please, please don't forget to give me a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. It's a free way to support the channel and it feeds those algorithm gods, which helps me grow as a YouTuber. Also leave me a comment down below. If you don't have anything to say, just say, hey creep, that helps too. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will catch you in the next episode of Library Macabre. Later creeps.